Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. It is an absolute privilege to be standing here with my colleagues who took a long journey and they are spending a lot of time here in El Paso uh, trying to better understand what is happening, not just in our community, but in the region. You know, this is uh, my office's 12th congressional delegation visit. This is by far the biggest. And in prior visits, what we have shown members of Congress has been uh, much of what you all have been reporting on. Overcrowded cells, very uh, inhumane conditions uh, here in this community, just like in many other border communities. But with the, the policies that have been rolled out by the Trump administration, migrant protection protocol and metering, much of what we have seen here in El Paso has simply been shifted across the river to Ciudad Juarez. These are policies that um, impact human lives, that put vulnerable migrants at risk, and that are completely totally, absolutely uh, um, policies of cruelty that are implemented at the hands of the U.S. government. I'm not going to say much. I'd like to uh, provide as much time for my colleagues who, as I mentioned, they've come a long way and they are spending a lot of time very generously in this community and in this region. Um, and so I'll, I'll pass it off now to our great chairman, the chairman of the Democratic Caucus, <coughs> Chairman Jeffries. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. We're certainly thankful for Veronica Escobar, the tremendous leadership that she has continued to provide uh, to the city of El Paso, to the people that she represents here in Texas, and indeed to the country. The fact that you have over 20 members of Congress from throughout the House Democratic Caucus who are here is a direct testament uh, to the faithfulness, the confidence, uh, the belief that we have in the leadership that Veronica Escobar continues to provide. We are here representing the entirety of the House Democratic Caucus in terms of people from every region of the country represented here today, every ideological sector of the House Democratic Caucus from progressives to new Dems to blue dogs, to problem solvers, are all with us here today because we recognize this is not a Democratic problem or Republican problem here along the border. This is an American problem. And it's going to require all of us to work together to fix the situation that you all have borne witness to and that we continue to bear witness to as members of Congress come to visit. We clearly have a broken immigration system. Uh, it's in desperate need of reform. We're committed to comprehensive immigration reform. We're committed to trying to do it in a bipartisan way. On this fact-finding mission, there were two objectives for many of us as members of the United States House of Representatives. One, we wanted to make sure that the resources that the Congress has allocated to deal with the humanitarian crisis at the border that was man-made in the view of many as a result of the xenophobic leanings that regularly come out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, we wanted to make sure that the taxpayer dollars that have been allocated are being spent to deal with the humanitarian crisis and you'll hear members share their perspectives on that. We also, as custodians of the rule of law, the Article I branch of government that makes the laws, want to make sure that our immigration laws that are on the books are being upheld. And one of the things that was deeply troubling to me as I prepare to yield to the great chairman of the Budget Committee was that there seems to be a deliberate attempt to undermine the asylum laws that are on the books of the United States of America. The current law says that if an individual 
arrives at our border and articulates a credible fear of persecution if they are to be sent back home, that they should be allowed the due process of having that asylum claim reasonably heard. But we've encountered individuals who showed up, requested asylum, and because of the policy that exists right now in the United States of America, was sent back over to Mexico, where it's not clear they will be able to have their asylum claims reasonably pursued because of the situation they find themselves in. Two individuals some of us spoke to, both were from Guatemala. One individual was an environmental activist who was concerned for his life as a result of his activism back in Guatemala. The other individual was someone who was a witness in a anti-corruption government trial against high-ranking members of the Guatemalan government who finds himself in fear of his life, presented his claim, but was sent back to Mexico. This is some small indication of what is happening with respect to the rule of law here on the U.S.-Mexico border, and it's deeply troubling. With that, uh, let me now yield to the distinguished gentleman from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the chair of the Budget Committee, John Yarmouth. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Hakeem. Uh, six years ago, almost to this very day, uh, we concluded a process in the House of Representatives. We, we, uh, I will, we were referred to as the Gang of Eight. Uh, there were eight bipartisan members who worked for seven months uh, in 2013 to develop a comprehensive immigration reform package. Uh, that year, some of you may remember, the Senate actually did pass a bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform package. In 2013, I came to the border, came to El Paso, uh, and got my first education in, in border enforcement and the challenges that uh, we face in securing a border. In the last six years, one thing I noticed is the situation has gotten worse, it's gotten, gotten more complex, it's got, gotten more confusing, and it's gotten a lot more uncompassionate. Um, when I looked at all the faces I saw today, I didn't see any people that I wouldn't have welcomed in this country. I saw a lot of beautiful young children, uh, some with their parents, some playing among themselves, uh, who were facing impossible odds to settle here in the United States and save them, their families from the threats that they face back home. We were told, for instance, that the actual percentage of asylum grants, uh, asylum claims that were granted in this area was somewhere between two and four percent, uh, whereas in other ports of entry, like in Baltimore and New York, it's 35 to 40 percent. So we have a system that on its face is, is unjust, inconsistent, and unfair. And meanwhile, these men and women and children are waiting here for months and months and months at a time with very slim prospects of being able to stay. Um, we need a lot of these people in our country. The Budget Committee, just a few weeks ago, we had a hearing on, on immigration and what it means for the budget going forward, the future. And basically, this country's economy cannot survive, cannot sustain itself, unless we have a significant Im increase in uh, immigrant population. And what better way to get that increase than to bring people who will forever love our country because we saved them and their families. So. The one thing I can say, while I'm frustrated and disturbed by a lot of what I saw today, I'm also, to a certain extent, inspired. Inspired by the bravery and the tenacity of 
the many migrants that we saw today. And I hope that our Congress on a bipartisan basis, which we did actually in 2013, even on the House, we, we developed it, we agreed upon a bipartisan bill that John Boehner, who was then the speaker, wouldn't bring to the floor. Uh, we could have avoided a lot of these problems, but we can do it on a bipartisan basis. We can do it again, and it's not optional for us to do it. It is absolutely mandatory. And with that, I have the honor of, rep of introducing the great representative from the state of Maryland, Jamie Raskin. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Escobar, who's a distinguished member of the Judiciary Committee, for convening all of us and bringing everybody to the border. Uh, our presence here is a demonstration of how serious members of Congress are about making sure that the reforms that we are seeking and that the money we've invested um, all go to improving conditions at the border and in the detention facilities. Um, we met uh, a lot of people fleeing from uh, Guatemala, uh, Salvador, Honduras. There was uh, one uh, immigrant uh, we saw from uh, Azerbaijan. There were several people from Venezuela we saw. Uh, lots of people being held here. We met uh, very hardworking, committed, decent members of the Customs and Border Patrol who don't want to be uh, associated with the zero tolerance policy and uh, family separation. And so uh, I'm glad that we've gotten over that and we're going to make sure that um, unnecessary family separations are a thing of the past um, in, in our country. And I guess the last thing I just want to say is that um, uh, we need to have a regional perspective on what's taking place here because um, the idea of slashing aid to Central American countries is just going to exacerbate the crisis and make it worse. Uh, we've got to be investing in our neighbors and lots of members of Congress are talking about developing a Marshall Plan for Central America so we can build decent livable societies there and replace failed governments and failed policies uh, from the past. And that's going to be a very important part for um, the long-term stability of, of our region getting a hold on the immigration crisis. And it's my pleasure to, to uh, introduce from Illinois Representative Brad Schneider. Uh, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I want to first thank uh, Representative Escobar, uh, you, but also your team for putting together uh, just an incredible experience. Uh, for me, I, it is uh, more than just an opportunity. It's, an op it's a responsibility to come and see for myself what is happening, as was mentioned earlier. And I won't repeat what's been said before, but I will associate myself with all of it. But to see for ourselves. Uh, flying down here yesterday, I sat on a plane next to an FBI, FBI agent, and the agent said, just make sure you come with an open mind. And I made that promise. And we, we came with an open mind. We've had the chance to visit both sides of the border, to visit a, deten a detention center on, on the Mexican side of the border, to vi visit with our consular office, uh, to visit with uh, Border Patrol here, to see for ourselves. And as I was looking at these families, these people of all ages uh, waiting to, to come to this country, I couldn't help but think of my own grandmother, who came to this country from Russia when she was five years old, more than 100 years ago. She was fleeing violence in the communities that her family lived in. She crossed a continent and then an ocean to come to a country that welcomed her with open arms, that gave her the opportunity to achieve her dreams. And as I looked at the people on both sides of the border waiting for processing, and I looked at the, the in particular, the young girls who were the same age, five years old, that my grandmother was, and to think of what this country is doing to make it more difficult for them to put their lives at risk, this is not the country that I think we can, should be or should be asp aspiring to. We had the chance to talk with some of those people. We had the chance to talk with the agents who are on the border. We know what we have to do. And as I said before, it's now up to Congress to get together, to work together, Republicans and Democrats, to come up with a just and moral solution to the crisis we're facing on the border. And as Representative Raskin said, it has to be comprehensive, not just giving the resources here at the border to make sure we're living up to the st standards we would expect of our nation, but to help to make sure 
that the people who are fleeing violence, instead of fleeing that violence, can make their homes in their own nations. And with that, it's my honor to introduce my colleague from Illinois, Representative Jan Schakowsky. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> this was a, a very emotional day um, for many of us, I think, to actually come here at the uh, invitation of the wonderful Veronica Escobar, our colleague, um, and, and see real people who are affected by this crisis that we're, we're seeing, a man-made crisis um, at, the, at the border. So we went across that, board, that border to um, Ciudad Juarez in the morning, and we went to Casa del Migrante, where we saw um, hundreds, uh, a place where hundreds of people are there in a really humane setting not representative, really, of the thousands and thousands of other people who have been sent back to Mexico, people who are already in the American system of seeking asylum. They have come across the border, they've been put on a list, and now we have this MPP um, policy, this uh, migrant protection uh, protocol, and some call it remain in Mexico, to send thousands of people back to Mexico. Later in the day, we met with officials from Juarez who were saying that they are not unhappy to show generosity to the people who are waiting there, sometimes months and months waiting there, to be called to go back to uh, the United States to cross the border to be, have their asylum case heard. But what we realized, I guess I didn't realize this before, that the United States of America has watched, washed its hands, washed our hands of these people. We take zero responsibility for what may be happening to them in Mexico. We met with a woman who is in danger in Mexico itself, in danger of sexual abuse, where she's so afraid that she is actually now said that she's going to return to Guatemala. Imagine, she, fle she was fleeing violence, and she's made the decision to go back. When we talked to people from Customs and Border Protection and asked about that, what's going on with the people that are sent back in Mexico, they said, well, we really don't know. And that's the truth. On this side of the border, we really don't know. And I would say that in general, this government doesn't really care. And so I think that it's just unconscionable that we aren't at least helping the Mexican government serve the people who are in our system waiting to get notice that they can come and just ignoring that situation altogether. That was the most moving part for me. And now to uh, continue in the um, tradition of Illinois, um, I'm going to introduce um, Representative uh, Raja Krishnamurthy, um, who is also joining us today. Good afternoon. And Thank you so much to Veronica Escobar and her team, as well as Chairman Jeffries and his team, the House Democratic Caucus, for supporting and organizing this amazing day. Um, it's been incredibly enlightening. Um, I myself am, am an immigrant. I came to this country when I was three months old as a small baby. And <clears throat> when I visited these different facilities today, the only thought that kept going through my mind was, there but for the grace of God go I. The way that we are treating migrants today is appalling. And I want to focus in on just one policy, the Migrant Protection Protocol. It has been wrongly named. It should actually be called the Migrant Deterrence Protocol because that is the purpose of this policy. It's not to protect migrants, but to deter 
migrants and immigrants in general from coming to the United States. That is wrong. And I believe it's illegal. Let me point to two aspects of this migrant protection protocol that are very disturbing. One, the families that are selected to go back to Mexico versus the families that are sent to NGOs here, for instance, in El Paso and in Texas, is completely arbitrary. There is no standard by which some families are sent back to Mexico to an uncertain fate and to those who are placed with NGOs here. And in fact, uh, Mr. Blanchard of the United States Border Patrol confirmed that. Secondly, the migrant protection protocol, the MPP, sends people into desperation. Mr. Blanchard confirmed that within the last few weeks, he believes that upwards of 20% of the people who have been apprehended at the border were actually sent previously back to Mexico as part of MPP. And today, we learn the results of what happens when these people try to come back to the border in desperation. One man... We learned today about the results of what happens when someone who was sent back to Mexico on MPP in desperation tries to return to a point between the points of entry. One man died today. One man died today in the custody of the CBP who had previously been sent back through the Migrant Protection Protocol. So I say the Migrant Protection Protocol has no basis in law. It has no basis in anything that has been formulated through Congress, and therefore I believe the MPP is illegal. I just close with another set of words that um, coursed through my mind as I was seeing these people in detention. And of course, that's the poem at the Statue of Liberty. And you know the words. Send me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send me these homeless, tempest-tossed. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. That is who America is. That is the DNA of America. And what the Trump administration is doing right now is completely against who we stand for as a country. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julia Bromley uh, from California, and I too uh, want to associate myself with all of the comments already made, and certainly to thank uh, Congresswoman Escobar for a wonderful, wonderful journey to her district um, and to have provided uh, the uh, the opportunity to see what was going on here um, in El Paso. I think there are just a couple of points that I would like to make, and one is uh, we just talked about the MPP program and how that policy, it's a Trump administration policy, and it's the policy is simply about deterrence. But from my perspective, it's really not working. What's happening is we're pushing everybody back into Mexico where the United States is not giving one penny to the people of Mexico to help who are taking care and taking the responsibility of these people. I talked to several people today and I wanted to know if they were aware of the Trump policy and what's happening at the border. And many of them said they understood what was going on, but they still came. And they still came because they have, still have hope, and hope from the American people and from this country. And when you have to weigh the fear from your country versus hope, 
there's only one choice. And the last point that I want to make is uh, I also went to McAllen, Texas. Uh, it's been pr practically a year ago. But what I learned there and what is continuing here is that when families cross the border to come here for asylum and they're a family unit, and if it's that family unit is only defined as a family unit if and only if the child is with a mother or father or both parents. Anyone else, whether it's an aunt, an uncle, a grandmother, a grandfather, an older brother, an older sister, none of those are within the definition of a family unit. And guess what happens? They get separated. So this just one piece in a, in a large, cruel policy piece to still separate families, when the Trump administration is out there promising that they're reuniting families, that is just absolutely false. They continue to separate families, and it's just a real tragedy. And again, I thank you all for being here. This is a very important issue, and I, again, I thank Veronica Escobar for a wonderful trip. Sure. So I want to say a few brief words in Spanish, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. And I'm going to encourage uh, all of my colleagues, anyone who feels inspired to do so, to answer any of the questions. Les quiero dar las gracias a mis colegas. Uh, han uh, venido uh, para ser testigos a lo que está pasando en la frontera. La crueldad que está pasando aquí, no solamente en El Paso y en lo, los Estados Unidos, pero en Ciudad Juárez. Ahora mucho de nuestro tiempo fue en Ciudad Juárez, donde pudieron visitar con migrantes, muchos de los migrantes que uh, estuvieron retornados por las pólizas de esta administración. Lo que es bien claro es que es importante que cada miembro del Congreso venga a la frontera, y por eso estoy tan agradecida, para poder buscar soluciones juntos y para poder cambiar lo que está pasando y, y pasar leyes que son leyes uh, con compasión en vez de leyes de crueldad. One last thing I want to say, R my colleague Raja mentioned the death that was announced today that was uh, a, a family who crossed after they had uh, been MPP'd, sent back to Mexico. These policies by the administration aren't just cruel, they are deadly. We know also as a result of metering that that painful picture of the father with his young daughter, Oscar Ramirez and his daughter Valeria, they were metered at the ports. And so what this administration is doing is not just creating misery, but it is creating mm -hmm. situations where there is death death that is at the hands of the american government those deaths a direct result of u.s policy so i'd like to open it up now for any questions and i'd like to encourage my colleagues who i again i have to tell you and and yes i'd like to thank um, the democratic caucus team that also flew in and did so much work my team the my fabulous interns and the great uh, team members uh, of um, District 16, without whom this, none of this would be possible. But really, my, my colleagues did more than, than parachute in for a day to get a briefing from law enforcement. They brought their passports, went across the border, spent the entire morning in Ciudad Juarez talking with migrants, talking with lawyers, talking with everybody who's been confronted by this system, came back across, toured the port, toured uh, Border Patrol Station 1. They're finally going to get a little rest in a few minutes. And then tomorrow uh, we will be talking with advocates. They will tour the ICE processing facility. And it wouldn't be El Paso without hearing about trade. And so they will get a trade round table as oh, well. No. So Q&A, please. Uh, Congressman, uh, Congressman. <laughs> I was just wanting to ask Aaron Mundus with the El Paso Times. There's a new policy was announced just a couple of weeks ago about migrants having to claim asylum in another country before they can assign trial uh, uh, claim asylum in the United States. Is that uh, 
what, what your all thoughts about that and also about this deal with Guatemala as a safe it's, haven? It, it is an example of the Trump strategy to try and let, make people's lives miserable with no respect to what's going on in Latin America, in Central America. A lot of the problems that people are fleeing are a result of American policy that went off the rails and trying to make Guatemala uh, a party of an agreement that they really are not going to be able to take advantage of and perhaps actually make the conditions worse is an example of the wrong-headed policy of this administration. Their strategy of making people miserable, undercutting things there, not investing resources that they should, and, may, and compounding problems going forward is why I appreciate the chance to see it in person. Uh, but it's, you look at the haunting faces of people who are in there, uh, it makes it clear that it's a failed strategy. I'm, I'm Earl Blumenauer from Portlandia. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tom Malinowski from New Jersey. Look, I'll, I'll give the administration credit for honesty. They're very honest about what their intention is. They want to end asylum. They want to end refugee admissions. While they are proposing this, they're also debating a policy of setting a cap of zero for refugee admissions from crises around the world. And they've been very honest about how they want to do this. Uh, Stephen Miller, who is the czar of all things immigration at the White House, has said that his mantra, quote unquote, is to create as many unsolvable dilemmas as possible for migrants so that they do not come. That is illegal, in addition to being contrary to our values and everything we stand for. And what we saw today, as you heard from others, is that it also does not work because people still come. And that has resulted in this, this policy of, of washing our hands of uh, of migrants sending them back to Mexico, which then causes them in desperation to do exactly what the Border Patrol does not want, which is to try to cross between ports of entry where they are more likely to die, where they are going to be detained, and more of a strain on our system. But it is a result of a very honestly, clearly stated policy by the administration <coughs> to end virtually all, to close virtually every avenue for persecuted people from any part of the world to come to the United States. It would be a departure uh, from decades of, our, of our American tradition, dating back, frankly, to the shameful period when we closed our doors to refugees from the Holocaust coming to America and promised we would never do that again. What would your old message be you know, to the family members of these, these countries where they lost family trying to cross this I'll, I'll go ahead and take it. As, as this uh, Ami Barra from California, my message to those family members would be that isn't who we are as the United States of America. That is not who we are as the majority of the public. We're a compassionate people. We're a country of immigrants. Our strength is one generation of immigrants after another woven together in this fabric that brings with them that hope for a better life. That's all these individuals are seeking. Now, as a senior member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, when we think about what the Trump administration is doing, look, the, the migrants that are coming across the border today have changed. In the, the, the 2010s, you know, it was individuals from Mexico coming across the border to seek work. But around 2014, you saw a different face. You saw women and children coming, unaccompanied minors. And now you've seen this huge influx since October of 2018 of folks coming from the Central Triangle countries, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. What this administration has done going against the will of Congress, because we've appropriated and given the administration millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to address the challenges in those countries at the root cause to prevent why those families are fleeing the violence and the lawlessness there. That is the right thing to do. We have to do this in the same way. Well, the administration, we've given them that funding. They've said they're not going to use that money. They've cut that funding. That's going to make this challenge worse. And we've seen the worsening of the crisis right here at the border. That isn't who we are. Let's step up. Let's be the United States of America. And let's lead the world in a compassionate way and help 
these individuals. That is who we are as a country. Were, were you yeah, briefed members? on the latest death today? It was a delegation brief when you were there, and if so, could you tell us what you were told? You know, it, so it was unfolding, and, and I'll let, think about this as a doctor. You know, this gentleman came across with, with um, his daughter, eight you know, eight years old, eight year old daughter. They were picked up, and just imagine, we have the luxury of going around in bands, how hot it was today. We have the luxury of getting bottled water. Well, this is a father and his eight year old daughter crossing. I can only imagine what that does um, to their health conditions, the condition that he came in. We were told that he was screened, that you know he answered the screening questions, that they were cleaned up, and then he, they were being transferred over to the New Mexico station and he collapsed. We were told that they started CPR and emergency um, preparations for him. They could not revive him and that he was you know, um, pronounced dead. So that isn't who we are and we can do a better job of this and we can do a more compassionate job. Can you talk more a bit about what you saw at the border today? Like, can you talk a bit more about what you saw out there? Excuse me, can I? There's one at a time here. Let's go here first and then. Can you talk a bit about what you saw at the border and at the, on your visit today? Can you just a bit more memories, things that you saw that stood out to you? Yeah, I'm sure you did. And also, how can you be sure that the law enforcement agencies gave you an accurate picture of what's going on? I mean, you're members of Congress coming down here, a party against the president. How can you be sure they didn't just clean it up for you guys to see? Well, I, well, we I think they did. Sides, they yeah. So that, that's, that's the thing. They, they cleared the places out through this migrant protection protocol. That is, that's the story Roger, of these, that's the story of these centers. They were, they were basically empty with maybe a couple, few dozen folks in, in these places, um, but they were largely free of people um, occupying any of the facilities because they sent them all back to Mexico. And, and that is the big, that's the big story here. They're clearing the place out by sending them back to dangerous conditions, and then these people show up between points of entry in desperation. And that's not who we are. And I believe the Migrant Protection Protocol is illegal. You don't send, you can't send people away uh, when they are claiming asylum, especially when they fear persecution in other places that you're sending them to. Sorry. And then. I'd just like to mention, several people have mentioned the issues about Central American countries and the monies that we put in and then withdrew. Over 200 years ago, America declared President Monroe, I presume, the Monroe Doctrine. And it basically said to the world, the Central America and Latin America is ours stay out of here. This is our place. And it was our place not to take care of the people, but to let industries and corporations in America take advantage of the raw materials and the workforce and the people to make enormous amounts of money for American corporations and for America. Well, it's time that we had a new Monroe Doctrine. We invested in those countries because by investing in those countries, we're paying something back. But more than that, we're protecting our southern border. This situation will only get worse unless we do it in a logical and intelligent way, and that's to have a new Monroe Doctrine. Do oh, my name is Jose Jimenez. No, my name is Steve Cohen. <laughs> 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 several representatives say that they believe they're illegal. What does the House Democratic Caucus plan to do about it if that is the belief? Veronica, you want to? Yeah. Is this your? So, so. It, that is tied up in the courts. Um, we have to work on legislation, and we're talking through it, how to stop MPP and metering. As you know, the challenge for us is uh, twofold, actually. Number one, as a caucus, we absolutely can find unity, even in our diversity, about ending inhumane practices, and we can pass bills out of the House. We have a Senate Majority Leader who is in lockstep with President Trump, uh, in trying to prohibit any kind of positive legislation from even uh, reaching a debate on the Senate floor. And in fact, the Senate, I, we, we've been tied up all day, so I haven't read the story, but it's my understanding that the Senate passed a bill today to allow for longer child detentions. Child, no, child detentions? I, see, I didn't read the story. It came out, uh, of, committee. It came committee. out of committee. Yeah. It came out of committee. Child detentions, but with their parents. Right, undoing the Flores Settlement Agreement, which protects children, right? So wildly divergent views of how we should treat human beings who are in our custody. 
The other challenge, I said there are twofold challenges. One is the legislative. The second is we have a president who has Stephen Miller running his immigration policy. They will stop at nothing to violate current asylum law. They will stop at nothing to work around the Constitution. They will stop at nothing to trample on who we are as a country and our values. There's only one way to stop that, and that's next year. So how optimistic are you that something will be able to get done? Let's get, let's get one more question. Yes. We've been saying that the system's broken for months since we were seeing record arrivals in April and May. That was when the burden was falling on local communities here in the borderland, NGOs and church groups to take care of these migrants, get them onto their destinations. Now it's MPP. If the asylum process, in your view, was working perfectly, if it was an unbroken system, can that happen and involve federal government detainment and processing? Is there a way for there to be an unbroken system with detainment? So I don't know that there's anyone who thinks the system was perfect. Um, uh, I think we all see the imperfections. Here's, here's the, the problem with the way things were working and why many of us have decried this as a man-made uh, humanitarian crisis. So Border Patrol agents appreh apprehend at the border. They then are supposed to only detain for the short term in their processing facilities while they process people and they're supposed to move folks into the custody of ICE. We're going to see, we're taking everybody to the ICE facility tomorrow. The bottleneck is ICE is refusing to take single adult males because they claim they don't have enough beds. But we know for a fact that ICE, that there's been an abandonment of alternatives to detention. There's been an abandonment of the, um, the uh, family uh, case management program and that there's absolutely no management of their population. Their uh, direction is my understanding from uh, the White House, detain everybody. We cannot build enough beds, nor should we build enough beds to detain everyone. We can manage this. We can manage this. You know, I just want to give one more, like just, just some context and then, and then we've got we've to head out. I, the, as part of a, 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 as a member of the House Armed Services Committee, I had the privilege of traveling with my committee to Jordan. We were taken to the Jordanian-Syrian border, presumably one of the most dangerous borders in the world, no wall. They processed 1.5 million refugees. 1.5 million! We had 150,000 in America and we call it a crisis. 1.5 million people come across their border. When we were asking how long it took them to process people, they were apologetic when they said, we're trying to work on it, it takes up to two hours. Their processing is not just about ensuring that, the, that they know who's coming in. As soon as they know that, they then look for housing, they look for social services, and they look for ways to integrate people into the community. The difference here is the choice that we make as a country to treat refugees and migrants as a national security threat and as a threat to the homeland. Moms and babies are not a threat to the homeland. And by mixing those populations, we are creating a dysfunctional and dangerous space for everybody. All right, thank you all very much. Really appreciate you.